Good evening, friends. It's a good Wednesday night, and we have gathered this evening for one particular reason, that the Lord would continue to stir our hearts as a people who love him by loving well those people God has placed in our lives, particularly many of whom have special needs, special ways in which we can care for them, make them feel loved, make them feel like they belong. And tonight we've got an expert in the house. Michelle Munger is here this evening to help us. We've got another expert too. Just We'll get to you in just a moment. Uh, Michelle has been with us before. She, you came out last summer and met with the session, walked through some pieces, uh, and session's been dialoguing. How can we as a church be more cognizant, aware, and loving for those who have special needs in our midst? Uh, She's going to talk a whole lot more about that, so I don't want to go any further there, but I just want to, again, mention that's why we're here together. The Lord's placed this on our heart. We long to be more loving as a congregation. Now, I don't want to say that what we're doing this evening is because we're not loving those individuals who need the Lord's love that often are pushed to the sides. We are doing that in a variety of ways. So this is a great segue to bring up one of our other pastors, Pastor Bill. I'm Pastor JT. Pastor Bill's coming forward. He's our pastor of discipleship. Uh, As many of you know, any discipleship needs go to him. But Bill's going to share uh, a little bit of a story as to how we've been loving some of those individuals. All right. Yeah, I think one of the ways that our church is doing a great job of loving people in our midst is by visiting, praying, sending cards. Like, our church is doing an incredible job reaching out to people, especially who are homebound, who are ill, or have had surgeries. So that's something that our church is doing a really, really good job of, and I'm proud of us for that. I think the deacons are leading the way and caring for people in our midst, and other people are doing that too. So th- I just wanted to say thank you for that, because that's a really big piece. And so I don't want to want us to hear this all that we're hearing tonight without realizing there's a lot of good stuff that we're doing already, and so we're just trying to continue to, to grow to be better and better. I also wanted to introduce a friend of mine. Uh, This is Quinn Valentine. The most important thing you might need to know about Quinn is that he and I are both persecuted individuals. Uh, We are both Texans living in Virginia. Uh, So, uh, but we know we're okay. We're doing all right. Uh, Quinn is the the new owner of Senior Helpers. So he took over the business in December. um, And I got to know Quinn because he came down here just to say, hey, there are a lot of people from Restoration that are involved in what we're doing. I need to get to know them and just want to share my appreciation. So I wanted y'all to be able to see him. So when you see him around, you can say hi. When you see his truck, you can appreciate that. Um, but also, he just wanted to share a few words about Senior Helpers with us. Well, first off, I'd like to thank all the individuals here at Restoration Church for putting on this event. So thank you so much for allowing me to come up here and say a few words. We are a home health agency which specializes in taking care of individuals with cognitive disabilities. So that is things such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, de- you know, dementia. So if you know of anyone who is struggling with those uh, ailments, we have staff who are trained to help take care of them. And so that way they can help maintain their independence and mobility in a comfortable setting of their home. And additionally, we are always looking for people within our community who want to lend a helping hand to these individuals as well. So if you have any questions about our care programs and the types of individuals that we work with, I'll be available after the event. And uh, yeah, so thank you again so much for having me. Thank you, Quinn. All right. (laughs) Michelle, let me bring you up here and I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you and start our time off here. Michelle and I had a providential meeting oh, about a month ago or so uh, in Gate B in Orlando Airport. We were sitting down, looking, eating our morning breakfast, not quite fully awake yet, right? And we were like, wait a minute, that's Michelle, that's JT. And we hashed out the whole evening right then and there, didn't we? <laughs> it, was, it was providential. Let's, let's, let's pray for our time. Father, I do thank you for Michelle. Thank you for bringing her all this way, Lord, to be with us, to help us as your people, Lord, who are called to love as you love, to help us in particular to think about loving those with special needs in our midst. I pray for Michelle that you give her words to speak. I pray you give her joy 
joy to, Lord, as she teaches us, equips, and encourages us to this end. We love you, and we commit this evening to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. they had actually wired it to be able to hear the message like this will be fine unfortunately it was um, Alameda California and it and whenever it would rain the, you couldn't all you got was static and because it's Alameda California it rained a lot so you couldn't hardly ever hear and I remember looking at my youngest my oldest and say little man you cannot not like music because his father and I, we used to lead music when we were um, just first married. And so music was an important part of our life. Fast forward, he wasn't reaching developmental my milestones, and the doctor wasn't worried. Everyone's their own, age, you know, grows at their own pace. And then his brother came along, and so they're two years apart. And just after the oldest two-year birthday, we took him to the doctor. He's still not doing all the things. All right, we should get him tested. And we found out that, and, and remember, this is also 2001. So that might give you a little snapshot. It might be helpful, Diane. But um, 2001, so we're just on the cusp of um, what has been now deemed this wave of autism diagnoses. So nobody really knew what they were talking about yet. And I remember the nurse saying, well, we can tell you it's not autism, but she wrote down the words pervasive development delay. Well, the internet was just brand new at that time, so I go home and I type in pervasive development delay. And what does it tell me? It tells me it's a form of autism. And their challenges, and the youngest, we you know, would watch him now like a hawk. He met all of his developmental milestones, but um, he wasn't talking. Um, he was meeting all those physical milestones, but he wasn't talking. And he was pretty aggressive and annoyed at the fact that he couldn't communicate. And he let everybody know that I'm annoyed. And generally, he would, put, he would mirror any emotion that he saw back at you a hundredfold. So I used to tell people I used to live with Gandhi and the Hulk. <laughs> That's the fastest way to describe my the way I lived, because they both for a long time preferred to be in their underwear, but the oldest was very quiet, mellow, go with the flow. He knew where everything was, but he was just very chill, and the youngest, it was not pretty, and he was mad. And most churches do not appreciate the Hulk in their Sunday school class. And so much so, even when I tried to call and say, I've I've got a, a child with some pretty significant challenges. I want to just see, you know, can you help us for us to be able to connect to a faith, to a church? And they're just like, oh, sure, come on. It'll be fine. We get there, and it's not fine. And I personally experienced um, being told we can't handle your family. And so my brain said, well, 
then there's no place for me in the church. I'm so thankful that the Lord, though, kind of kept a hedge of protection around me, that I never blamed God for it. I knew that the issue was with the body itself, that we just weren't equipped. And even before, I was in church all of the time, and I never saw individuals with with disabilities at church. We rarely saw them at school. They were the, the group even that, you know, was off in the corners during lunchtime where you'd see them traveling in the hall, but you never interacted with them. And so it was, it was really tough to reconcile the idea that I've got a pretty huge responsibility in my children that, that are now, I don't see how I can be in full-time ministry, but also be parent to these kids, right? And it took the Lord a couple of years before he actually, I know I heard in my spirit, you have a job to do. So that kind of set me on this path of what would it look like to try to gather the resources, gather the, the knowledge necessary to help our, our churches be able to welcome families with disability well. So that's kind of, you know, the really short version of, of why I'm here. And, and like I said, that was 2001 with the diagnosis. The Lord got a hold of me in 2005, 2004, 2005-ish. And um, it's taken quite a long time, though, bef- to, to get to this point where I, I can come and, and be a part and, and help you all think through some things. So, um, so that's, that's just quick. And, I mean, testimonies are really tough to pull them down really tight, but I really want to, we have so much that I want to try to get to, and I know we're not going to get to all of this, so um, um, everyone, does everyone have a copy? If there weren't enough, I see there's four at about, okay, there were four at each table, so the booth guys, there's two sitting up there if you needed another copy. We're not going to get to all this, so um, don't freak out, we only have an hour and some. So, um, but we're going to get to a bunch of it, and then you'll have some good things to chew on um, in, in the future. So, I would actually, oh, I have a clicker. That's right. So, if you turn to the first page, you're going to see this peculiar puzzle piece that has a green side and a pink side. And I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Barbara Newman, who um, she is actually my hero in this, in this work of disabili- faith and disability work. She is, unfortunately for us, has passed on, but um, her legacy is, is pretty amazing. And she's going to introduce this concept of the puzzle piece, and then we're going to do an exercise around that. that knitting project. Green for those areas that are really easy for us. Those are our strengths, they are our gifts. And pink, well, what shall we say, for our hot spots, the things that are more difficult for us. And would you agree that everybody gathered here today could wear this like our name tag with our name in the middle and we could fill it in. Things that are easy, our strengths, pinks, challenges. It's a complex knitting pattern that God uses for each one of us. We can be green and pink in so many different areas, but the truth is, that's all of us. And while I probably would have rather handed in my green and pink puzzle piece and exchanged it for a green one that's all together green, anybody here want to trade that in for something like that? You know what I would say? Beautifully hand-knit by God. Each one of us, fearfully and wonderfully made. But I want to tell you some lessons that I learned from puzzle pieces. Because I think this is important. Have you ever noticed that many times a person with a disability is viewed as an all pink person? Oh, it's Down syndrome, Jonathan, it's cerebral palsy, Sue, it's bipolar, Frank, it's dementia, Andrew. And it's like that defines the entire person. You know what? That is not a very
biblical people. Scripture is very clear that God has given everyone gifts to bring to the body to build it up. Every part is important. So we know from the beginning that there are no all pink people. Unless you sit in a place where you feel some pressure to be an all green person, let me just tell you that's not biblical either. That is not how we are intended to live. And in fact, this is one of my favorite verses from 1 Corinthians 12. Puzzle pieces fit together. Places where I'm strong, I can come along with somebody else. In places where they're strong, they can come alongside of me. We fit together like a puzzle in the body of Christ. Do we not? And what a beautiful verse that illustrates it. In 1 Corinthians 12, 18, but in fact, God has arranged or placed the parts in the body, each one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So not only did God take time to hand knit each one of us here, but then God places us into communities so that we can use our gifts to grow that place. We might not have all the answers, but we want to have the same pose that Jesus Christ had for each one of us. You are welcome here. There's a place of belonging. All right, so each of you it, at your tables, if you did not come prepared with a pen, they, I would like for us to take a few minutes and let's fill in our puzzle pieces. What are the areas that you, ha are, you are strong at? Put those on the green side and those spaces that maybe we need a little bit more help on, put those on the pink side. Let's take a couple minutes and do that. Okay, about one more minute.
it and I hear paper rustling, so I hope you all are digging into that chocolate because I don't want to take it home. So tell, tell, let's, is anybody willing to, to share how did it feel to kind of lay out your strengths and your weaknesses? Eye opening? Uh, awkward? Absolutely. Painful? Mm, the list is longer than we thought. And I think, you know, Barbara Newman made a point that I hope that, that we can kind of grasp a hold of is that most of us would prefer to not think about our pink, right? That we would prefer to have a piece that's all green. And yet for so many people, they are viewed as an all pink person that we, that we seem to, for maybe it's unintentional for sure, but we skip over all the things that we can do and go straight to the things that we cannot. And, and, that, and that's just not how God has made us. And, he has, and God has specifically made us to need one another, right? To be in community with one another. And generally, people who don't need one another, I mean, it's much easier to stay home, right? To order all your food in and, you know, to get your groceries delivered, we live in an amazing day and age now where it's so easy to not have to be around people, right? Especially in this post-COVID world that we live in. It's, we've figured out so many ways to avoid having to interact with people. But God wants us to interact with people. He purposely made us to be in partnership, to need one another, right? So examining ourselves and, and this is a question that's, that's there in that um, facing page, um, page three. You know, how does knowing our puzzle piece help us relate differently to others? And I just invite you, we'd, I want to keep going, but, you know, if you would take some time this week just to reflect on what that kind of looks like from, from your own perspective. And I'd also like to suggest that this isn't just about disability. It's not just about the, the cognitive impairments that, that get labeled, right? I'm wondering how many of you have or know of someone who is dealing with a child and math, right? That did come home with their math homework, right? How many of you know somebody that or might be that person who's dealing with math homework, right? And how many of you, which of you would put math in your pink section, right? Some of us would, would not be really excited about having to help a, a child in, in elementary school, and especially in high school, right? I've seen some very funny um, you know, things about parents having to, you know, we're, we're learning math and we're failing math together, right? <laughs> Even though the parent, right, went through it so many years ago. We're failing math again. So, um, so what would it look like then to find somebody who does, who has math in the green section of their puzzle piece and connect them, right? I'm not good at math, but Bill is, 
So, Bill, can you come and help us, right? Or can we come here and spend a half hour to help figure out? Now, I don't know if Bill does math, and so nobody ask him because he has to do math. So, <laughs> But it's that kind of thing. It's w- how can we identify the spaces where we might need our community to help us be better, right? And, and I think even the, the senior helpers that we, that we heard about, right? If we live long enough, all of us end up with some kind of impairment, some kind of disability. Disability is the largest minority group that anyone can join at any moment in time. We can be born into it. We can have an accident and end up part of it. We can have a stroke. We can have traumatic, we can have a, we can fall and have a traumatic brain injury. You can, it's the only minority group that any of us can join. And generally, if we live long enough, we all end up there in that space. So, um, so yeah. So puzzle piece perspective. It's, it's a thing that, it's a foundational piece that I think all of us can take in order to be able to consider how, how do we find the strength in, in anyone in, or everyone rather, right? How can we help them find their strength so that they can be a contributing member of the body of Christ just as God is, is hoping that they will be? All right, let's flip the page here. All right. So this gets down into the meat that JT and I spoke about there in the Orlando airport. And I will say right offhand, that this is one of the toughest things for any of us to grasp, to get our minds around, to get our arms around, to hold it, because it's, it's slippery and it's elusive. The language that is out there as it relates to how we think about individuals with disability is always changing. And you may have noticed that the, the event that we, we build this event as loving individuals with special needs. But I've been talking about it as loving individuals with disabilities. And there's a purpose for that. And there at the top, there's actually kind of a, a little bit of a spectrum. Um, there's actually one more word that I thought, do I add this word? No, I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to write this word. But there are derogatory terms that have been used throughout history. And some of you are, prob- are shaking your head, and you probably know exactly the word that I'm thinking of. It starts with an R, right? And sometimes we still hear it, and, but there has been significant efforts to really put away that word so that I'm not even going to type it, and I'm not even going to say it, right? Because I think most of us know. And if you don't, it's okay. And just see, see someone who's nodding their head or see me after, and I'll clue you in. But the language, and it's, it's a spectrum, where the first word that I have on here on this handout says handicapped. And that we still hear all of the time. We have handicapped parking. We have handicapped transportation. We have, it's, it's one of the only ways that universally we talk about this, that everyone understands what, it, what handicapped is. The people in the handicapped community, especially if they're younger, Sometimes they're not really excited about being called handicapped, right? So, so then over time, especially over the last 15 years ago, well, 20 years, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, special needs was the new word that we used that instead of calling someone handicapped, they were special needs. And there's really been a move now, though, for kind of coming back around to utilizing the term disabled. There are so many personal advocates, people who have disabilities, who are trying to reclaim the word to because it's become part of their identity and it's okay that they're quote unquote disabled. And there's there's a lot of different models out there. Like I said, there's so much to cover, but there's actually two main models 
of this ability for, for you to consider, and you might want to jot these down. The one is the medical model of disability. The medical model says that you are disabled because you were born without the capacity to do a thing, you are, or you're physically not capable of doing something that most others can, right? And it's, it's the medical model where we can fix you with medicine, with a surgery, with whatever. And if we can't fix you, then you are definitely um, handicapped, you are definitely disabled, and sorry for your bad luck. I mean, that kind of is what the medical model feels. We can't fix you with medicine, therefore um, we just have to help try to help figure out how you can be comfortable and live, live in this world. The other model is the social, social model. Those are the, and there are more models, but the social model talks about the idea that we're only disabled because society around us essentially has barriers that prevent us from living like anybody else. For example, I will never forget, I gave a ride to a gal who was um, blind, and um, definitely blind, 100% blind, and um, I went to pick her up, and because it was just so much easier for me to give her a ride to the event that we were headed to, and uh, instead of her depending on the handy ride system, right, the public transportation. And she shared with me that she had just recently moved from Boston, and that in Boston, she did not feel like she was disabled. Because in Boston, they have an amazing public transportation system. They have an amazing um, sidewalks and curb cutouts and audible noises to alert her to things. They've just thought about all the things. So she was able to traverse her city, get groceries on her own, do her laundry on her own, do all of the things on her own for the most part. And then her parents got sick. And so she moved home to Newport News, Virginia. And Newport News, Virginia is not <laughs> Boston <laughs> by any shake of the stick, right? And even, and I would dare say even most of our localities in Virginia are not anywhere near prepared to support um, people in that kind of urban um, setting. So, I mean, that, and that was just a, kind of a, a clue back for me, you know, not having personally experienced that level of um, inability to maneuver in my world. You know, the fact that she was able to really pinpoint that I did not feel disabled when I had supports, when I could hear when the um, crosswalk was about to change, when I could hear all of the things. And um, so there's a lot of work to be done, right, in that respect. But it, it kind of goes back to um, how people are perceived, right, as all pink people or, or whatever. So the and so again, the language is changing, um, and th you may have noticed there's actually a couple of great. Um, there's actually one video that I almost pulled um, from a group of folks, actors and actresses with Down syndrome. And they actually put on a little thing about, is this really a special need? Or is, you know, it would be a special need if I had to be woken up by an actor, right, in every morning in order to ca carry about my day. And it was, and it's, it's a great little skit, you know, of just some absurdity things that are special needs. But no, they're n it's not a special need to want to be loved or to want to feel welcomed to want to feel like they belong to a, a group, you know, to feel that they are just as important in their community as anybody else. That's not a special need. So that's why I've, and I've been trying to utilize that word disability as well. Now, it's not to say that you guys can't use that word because it does conf convey some very quick ideas to people that aren't um, familiar with how the word disability is kind of ebbed and flowed in, in the vernacular. So I'm not saying you don't have, you know, to not use it. I'm just 
kind of giving you awareness of if you do start to see where the word special needs kind of fading off, that's why. All right, this next one, person first versus and or identity first. Anybody have any idea what those are? A blind lady versus a lady with blindness, exactly. So the person first language says that we are a lady first before we are blind, right? Whereas the identity first says that I'm a blind lady, and that's perfectly okay. I'm good with that. The tricky part with this one is that people are all over the map with this. And you almost have, it almost has to be one of those things that you have to ask. Do you prefer person first language or identity first language? And if they've been part of the disability community for any length of time, they'll know exactly how to answer that question pretty quickly. Now, if you ask a newly diagnosed, you know, a mother of a newly diagnosed child with cerebral palsy, which language, they're not going to know anything about what you're saying, right? So, um, but she'll eventually figure out, do I want my child to be identified as a person with cerebral palsy or as, um, you know, actually, that does, that's not a very good analogy, is it? Because it doesn't flow. Anyway, so blind blind lady, lady with blindness. And actually, the autism community is really hot on this conversation, especially those that can self-advocate for themselves. The autistic community does almost, for for the most part, many of them prefer to just embrace the fact that they are autistic. I'm autistic, and and that's okay. Now, that's not everybody. But it's really important to ask those who can communicate that do have autism which they prefer because it'll, it will actually express a level of, um, I'll just use the word hospitality, to just acknowledge that they have their own thoughts and opinions about the challenges that they live with every day. So, um, you know, and for us to honor that by asking them which they prefer um, is, would be super helpful for them. So just knowing that there are those two different spaces and knowing which one, you know, knowing that we should ask. And if the person who, dire- who is um, disabled themselves can self-advocate, we always want to ask that person. We always want to assume competence. We want to s- assume that they can answer for themselves that they understand our questions. And when they prove otherwise, or when you know the parent steps in, right? But for the most part, we always want to assume competence and let them be a part of, of answering those kinds of questions. All right, so the next one. Ministry two, ministry four, ministry with, or ministry by? For the longest time, ministry has usually been two, right? We have a ministry to individuals with special needs. We have a ministry to the senior center down the road, right? If something is done to you, how do you feel the recipient about that, that, those actions? Do you feel like you're part of it at all? Do you feel like you have a say-so? And, you know, we have a ministry to the youth, right, but we never ask the youth where they want to go eat dinner, right? Right? We just decide we're going to take them to the pizza buffet because it's super easy. But we've had pizza for the last week, and we don't want pizza anymore, right? So they end up revolting, <laughs> right? That may not have ever happened to you yet, but it, it will if, <laughs> if we don't start asking them, right? Minis- ministry two is generally the language that we have used, and um, 
there's actually, a, I, I propose that, there are, that there's a better way. And that next better way is ministry for. We have a ministry for people with disability. But again, do they really have a say-so in what's said and what, ha- what happens in that? Right? So it's getting a little bit closer, though, I think, than something being done to you. Now something's being done for you, right? It's kind of hard to be grumpy when something is being done for you, right? You know, you should be grateful that we are having pizza, (laughs) right? But then the last two, ministry with and ministry by, these are the the spaces that disability ministry, the the entire faith and disability ministry world right now is trying to get us toward. And it's going to be a process. And let me just back it up right now and say this is definitely a process. And that I am not, there's nobody, nobody can expect that we can snap our fingers and it'll all be perfect on Sunday. That's not, that's not the way this works. I know this. But we can start thinking about ways, little ways, for how we get to these new spaces. So ministry with the youth. Ministry with people who are struggling with, you know, um, with autism. Ministry with people, right? That's a whole different connotation of, of how we interact with one another, right? And then the ultimate ministry by, right? There is actually an article. I didn't have too many copies of it, but some of you may have picked it up, that generally our, our faith communities struggle with, helping individuals with disability identify their strengths so that they can serve. And that's really just a matter of, again, going back to that puzzle piece and helping each of us just acknowledge that we've all got strengths and weaknesses. And generally, um, and, and we actually have scripture that says we have all been given gifts, right? That word all is in there. It doesn't say the able bodied have been given gifts, it says all. My youngest, who is 22 now, he is nonverbal. I cannot have a conversation with him. He can't tell you how his day went other than to say, yes, it was good. Well, and I say, was it good? And he says, yes. (laughs) He knows that. But he is such a great helper. And And if you model for him what it is that you would like for him to do, then he'll be right there with you to do it. I remember um, he actually had an opportunity to work with some of the deacons in a church that we attended where he would help um, collect the offerings. And, you know, a deacon was right there with him to make sure that, you know, he he passed it gently instead of, you know, (laughs) some other ways that an that a teenage boy could do, and, you know, not slinging it across the, the sanctuary. But after a few times, he didn't need that buddy anymore, right? He had learned the routine. He learned what was expected of him, and he was able to participate just like anybody else. And that was such amazing gift for him. You could see the, the joy on his face when he got to get up and got to help and be a helper. So, so that's, that, that's a huge deal um, that, that sometimes it's a lot easier for us to do it, just do it ourselves. It's a lot easier to, um, to not take the time, right, to, to be that model um, in order to help somebody. But um, it, the, the rewards will be so much more worth it if we, if we just take, willing to take some of that time. Any questions before we dive into this next big? Anybody have something tickling that just has to has to be asked? Mm-hmm. Yes, JT. Yes. 
take the microphone that's being held handed to you. Disabled. Social model. Um, considering that so many of those can be addressed by medicine. Right. I mean, I mean, I know it is a very real thing that, um, you know, um, and the saying was right on, you know, what? No, there's a saying about um, better, better living through um, through chemistry. Yes. Better living through chemistry. Right. And that applies to lots of things. You know, our our, our knees that don't that that start to ache when the weather gets awful, but we have, there are so many folks that, that really need, even those that have very strong faith, that need that little bit of chemistry help for the brain, right? So uh, the, the thing about the models is more about how we think about the person in that, in the body of Christ, we don't need to fix them, right? We don't need a person to be fixed of their disability, of the thing that they, that they struggle with. Really, what God asks us to do is love them. Now, now yes, there is, there is absolutely, I believe in healing, but God doesn't heal everybody. One of, one of my biggest heartaches as a young mother was being told that you just need more faith and your child's tongue will be loosed. And that's still a thing that happens, right? So, I mean, that's 20 years ago, but it still happens. We still hear the heartbreaking stories of someone who comes up to somebody who's lived with cerebral palsy for 40 years and somebody comes up to them and wants to pray and expect them to stand up that person with cerebral palsy, generally, the ones who have gotten to that age, they've accepted that this is how God has made them. And it's okay if, my cerebral pal if their cerebral palsy isn't corrected on this side of heaven, right? And for someone to come up and assume and just take control, lay their hand on them, which is a no-no, right? They didn't ask permission to touch them, right? And to essentially command them to walk in the name of Jesus, what in the world? Right? And it still happens. Right? And I hope we don't get nasty, nasty notes on YouTube or anything about, <laughs> about that. But the Lord is very, the scripture even, I think, is very clear that some were healed even by Jesus and some were not. Right? He walks into the pool of Bethesda, which is nothing but a giant hospital, and only one person walks out that didn't walk in, right? And we don't know why. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges is answering those why questions. How is it that God can let me stay here when my faith, when I know my faith is good? But then we also have Paul, who also prayed three times for the thorn in his side, in his thorn to be removed. And what did the Lord say? My grace is sufficient for you. I'm not going to heal you. And for those of you that might be paying attention to The Chosen, which is a very fun series, there's actually an interaction in The Chosen with Jesus and little James. And if you haven't had the opportunity to see that episode, it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and it's those two, ministry with and ministry by. Those are the spaces that we're trying to get to. And um, there's actually an article over there. One of the heroes in the faith and disability community is um, Dr. Eric Carter. He is actually not part of a faith community faith community directly he's a researcher but he is doing amazing things he actually just took a position at Baylor and is doing amazing things at Baylor now but um, he's got there's two articles over there by him and his article about belonging has some very practical things for us to consider but it also talks about kind of this spectrum of where we've been in the disability world where people were excluded Right? We never saw them. They were in institutions. Right? They didn't even exist. That's, that's a kind of part of the paradigm shift that has had to happen when institutions closed right? and most of the people were sent back to their communities. Uh, communities weren't wor- ready for them. Right? But now you started to see them. So they were excluded. They were tucked away. Then they were segregated. Right? They, were kept in, they were kept in their own little bubble away from everybody else, and then, uh, I'm I'm forgetting the third one, but then they, you know, the the goal is to be included. That's kind of been the the space where most of our faith and disability conversation has been, Um, but now there's kind of that next step. What happens after we're included? We need to figure out how to help them belong, right? Being included in something and someone feeling like they belong are two totally different concepts. And those are really important ideas and there's good opportunities for us to explore what that's like. And JT, it it just occurred to me, I don't know what time it is, so if you can kind of (laughs) give me a, oh my gosh. Okay, so, all right. So let's, let's dive, anything else, actually? It's good stuff. All right. Okay, so, we're gonna, I'm going to run through this really quickly so we can get to the, the center part of your handout. So this next page, universal design and responsive design. Barbara Newman, whom you heard just a bit ago, she also ha- she's got a one-hour plenary um, recording talking specifically about this concept of universal design and responsive. Do we have any architects in the room? No? So an architect has thought about this idea of universal design, where when they go to build a public building, if it's got more than two stories, they're not going to go around to the neighborhood and knock on all the doors where there's ramps and ask them, do you think you're going to use that building down the road? Because if you are, then we'll probably need to put an elevator. But if you're not, then we could save a lot of money. So... Um, No, they don't do that, right? If it's got multiple stories, it's part of the ADA law requirements that an elevator goes in. There's also, you know, the the Americans with Disabilities Act has lots of things in it to help make sure that our buildings are physically accessible. Even our, if you think about the fact that our elevators, there's a ding, right? That's that's on purpose, right? It's not just, you know, just to sound pretty, right? It's to let the person that can't see know that, oh, we've stopped at the floor. And, you know, and if you're in a fancy hotel, you even, uh, you know, it even declares which floor you're on, right? So, which is super helpful. So, um, so the universe, so universal design is where they've thought about, you know, that, where they have an expectation that someone is going to need, thank you, that someone is going to need this thing, whatever it is, fill in the blank, that we've built in supports so we can be always prepared for as many sum- scenarios that we, as we can think of. Restoration is pretty awesome in that it's, it's already a commercial building, so you've already got the curb cut out, out front, you've already got restrooms, that with stalls that are larger, right, that generally a person who is in a wheelchair can get into the restroom and actually close the door and use the restroom with dignity, right? Most other churches, they're, they're not so well, um, well equipped 
And unfortunately, the American with Disabilities Act did not make it mandatory for faith places of worship to change anything about their space, which is unfortunate. Um, and actually, there's, if you look at the history, there's also those who are really upset with the faith community because they lobbied pretty extensively to not be to not have to be required to do lots of things. Now, those people that were part of it, you know, I think if they were still alive today, they, they were thinking very specifically about one aspect, you know, of why they should be um, exempt from this law. And I get that. I totally get it. However, in the letter that the faith communities got together to write, it essentially said, we know how to care for individuals with disabilities. We don't need anybody to tell us what is, what is good for them. We'll just do it anyway because it's part of the ethos of who we are. And unfortunately, time has shown us that that actually hasn't been the case, right? That we haven't run out and spent thousands of dollars to revamp our restrooms you know, because it costs thousands of dollars. And recently there have been changes where um, I if you ever visit a church and it's obvious that they just haven't done any work for a long time, it's because if they do any major renovations, then they do have to come under code. They do have to make those changes. So they're just going to stay with the status quo because for them... The value add does not compute, doesn't add up for them. And that's pretty tough to, to go through. And those that are as negatively affected by the fact that, we, that the general church community doesn't do those things, right, it's one of the reasons why they say, you know, I don't need the church because the church doesn't value me enough, right? So... So there's this, this tension there that is unfortunate, for sure. And this last um, item here, no one may need it today, right? So we're going we're gonna to actually spend the resources, we're going to do what we need to in order to create a spell space that is most welcoming, because no one may need it today, but we expect that someone may need it tomorrow, right? We're just going to do it because we need to do it, right? And one of these days, I hope, JT, that we could get a ramp. We have a ramp here to come up here. Oh, yay! Is it hiding or is it? It's hiding in the closet. All right. Yes. But what would it look like for it to be out all of the time? Right? Instead of pulling it out when you know somebody needs it, you pull it out because you expect that someone may show up. You know, what if Bill's, Bill's off at Presbytery or he's down at Orlando for a week, right? He and his wife are having a great time on, on vacation. And you haven't pulled out that ramp, but somebody three weeks ago came to church and knows that there is a ramp, right? But now it's not there. It's something to consider, right? I mean, and I just love the fact that you actually have it, at least, for sure. So, good job. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of, the mo one of the most painful things for me was watching, actually, at our national... Um, never mind, I'm not going to say this here. There's been challenges in other places. And it's, it's tough to watch them. So when I know that we could do better, but I'm not going to share that story here. All right, moving on. All right, so universal design. Um, so and an another idea here, again, where some of these things, it's not just about disability, right? Could it be that I'm not inviting my friends to church because, fill in the blank, because the music's too loud? Now, I saw that you've got earplugs 
so that's not really a, a thing, right? But what if the earplugs aren't sufficient, right? It's just, you guys are just rocking it really good, right? You know, what would it look like to have a basket of the noise-canceling earphones that provide pressure and noise-canceling, right? You just have them for whoever needs them, right? And, but then you also have the basket for them to put them in after they're done so they can be sanitized, right? But it's those kinds of things, you know, that we can set up in place. Say we expect that people with sensory issues might come. So we're going to make sure in case they forgot their own earphones, because especially if the family's been, you know, dealing with challenges. I remember, you know, packing up just all kinds of stuff to bring. But if they forgot it, right? Or, you know, Josh used it at the house and it didn't get be- put back in the bag, so now they show up expecting them to be there and they're not there. Oh, my gosh, we can't stay. And then they turn and look. Oh, you have a basket of noise-canceling earphones. We can stay. One of the most fun things that I, I saw, an example of this, and again, the things that, and I'm going to say this, and I haven't said it enough, So we're talking about the disability community. And in the United States, 26% of the U.S. population is considered disabled in pretty significant ways. There are things that they are, that they deal with every single day that prevents them from doing something. Doing something like the other 74 See, I'm not, math is not on my pink, on my green side. The other 74% of the population, right, can do well, right? So um, the things that we do for the 26% ultimately help the 100%. One, I was, we, one of the churches that I had the privilege of attending, we had a tiny little next to the door, we had a tiny little shelf with a basket full of fidgets. They were just like bass flutes and, you know, the, um, and all the words are escaping me, but it was a basket of fidgets. And I'm loving, loving these fidgets over here. And I almost, you know, so there's a little basket right there that your children's department has fidgets, by the way. But what would it look like for us to have a basket here at the door because We had a young, very young mother who had, uh, I think she was 10 10 months old, wasn't even a year, and a two-year-old. And it's a tiny church, and there was still some um, attachment things going on with the two-year-old, so he was not going to the nursery. But if he had things, if he had his toys, if he had his things that were familiar to him, he could sit in the service. And it was great. She got to church, and mom realized that the baby's toys bag did not make it into all of the things. And she, f- she figured that out when she stepped in the door. And it had only been a couple weeks since we had established the fidget basket. And as she was turning around to leave, because she knew she wouldn't be able to sit in the, in the sanctuary, she saw the basket. It's like, oh, I can just pull something from here. These things are soft. They're appropriate for, for the baby. And she was able to worship with us that day. Now, she was not the target demographic, right? But she benefited from it. A couple weeks later, a gentleman who was in his l- mid-70s, loved to sit with and still sing with the choir. He, he, I watched him as I was um, serving, um, leading worship that one morning. I watched him stand up, take two steps, two very slow steps to the basket, pull out a stress ball, and then go back and to, to his space. I never expected him to pick it up. But for whatever reason, he needed that, that motion. He needed that input. So it's the things, the things that we put into place 
Um, how many of you, when you've gone to the store, have pushed that blue button, right, that's with the little handicap symbol on it, right, and the door magically opens for us? Usually, right? It's very sad when it doesn't, <laughs> right? But was that button intended for you? Probably not. It was intended for the person that cannot reach, you know, where most of those doors are so heavy, right? They don't have the strength to pull it, so you hit the button, so it's that assist, right? But it's those kinds of things that, you know, were intended for a small group of people, but no, we all end up utilizing and, and benefiting from them. So we're going to, so the universal time, we're going to think about or try to think about as many things as possible. And then the responsive design are those things when we recognize we cannot think of everything, right? But we can create a plan and process for addressing individual needs. And th these are the magic words. We're not sure how to handle that, but let's figure it out together. Those, those times when, as, as a young mom, if someone had just said that to me, instead of saying, we can't support your family, if they had said, we're not sure we're equipped, but let's figure it out, those would have been magic, magic words, for sure. So, so when we start, though, having to have conversations about um, how we individually respond, there's this little tag here at the bottom. We have to be prepared for what I call the tension of accommodation. And I don't have that much time. So this is, so is going to be a fire hose, all right? So middle, open up our, our things here. So this is a, probably a, a pretty... Um, odd looking thing here but all will be made clear here all right so we've got a heart so i'm going to explain this since we're recording we've got a heart and on one side of that heart we have listed the body of believers and oh yeah i totally missed all that because we, we're out of time all right tension of comedy let's let's do that first all right so we have the church and we have the family i'm gonna i'm backing up um, and in the middle, that space is where the storms are. Those two columns there, the church has capacity to deal and do things with and for another person. The family has a capacity to do things with and for others. And often, depending on what it is, those capacities look very different, right? We might have a high amount to be able to, to respond to somebody's request, but we also might have a very low ability to respond depending on what it is, right? All right, let's go to the next one. And then, um, all right, so now we get back to our heart illustration. We've got the body of believers on one side, the individuals on the left, on, oh my gosh, left and right. It's obviously not a strength right now either. All right, so our ability or our capacity to move beyond our comfort level or threshold is what this image is helping us to visualize. And you'll notice in that center is, it says comfort threshold, right? And that line goes all the way up and down. So now if you take your hand out and turn it counterclockwise, it'll make a little bit more sense, okay? So when we turn it clockwise, notice that your, for the body of believers, capacity, and you, it may be difficult to see because I didn't make them a good color contrast against the ivory paper, but you'll notice that there's a grid here, right? That there's, we have capacity um, markers. So this, this image of this, this first um, thing that dips way into the body of believers side, all right, this, this is the scenario. The child is running wild up and down the aisles throughout the whole service, okay? That's our um, example issue. 
the church has a very low capacity <laughs> with allowing this to happen, right? There's all kinds of reasons, especially within a Presbyterian Reformed um, setting, right? We like our order. We like our, we like to make sure that the children are not going to face plant and we have to call 911, right? That's not a good thing to do during the Sunday service, <laughs> right? So, so the church's capacity is pretty low. So, um, and, but then the parents' capacity, right? Now, if, if you notice, their capacity has crossed over the com- their comfort threshold, and it's kind of stopped, though, before it meets the threshold, the, the line for the body. Of the, does everybody see that? Does that make sense to see what's going on here? And there's a gap, that red space with the uh, light, with the thunderbolts and the explosions, right? There's a gap there where the, this is still a new enough concept for me that I'm still working on how to explain it better. So thank you for your grace. So the, the challenge is when our capacity to meet a person's need and the person's capacity to meet your, your, at your side of the request, when they don't meet, that's the tension of accommodation, right? That's that space where we have to work extra hard and it can get very messy when we can't meet the needs of, or the perceived needs of the individual that's making a request, right? If mom says, well, y- you just need to let her run, well, that's not really, that's not good, right? The farm marshal came in. He's not going to be happy about a child running amok, right? Especially if there's live candles and all of the things, right? Who knows what could happen? You know, and by the same token, you know, if there's another issue, the other issue that's got the red gap in it, um, and actually I probably should have started with that one because that one has the blue, the blue arrow, shows the capacity of the body of believers. The yellow arrow shows the ability or the capacity of the family, right? And those, those points are not matching. Therefore, there is tension. Now, it, you'll notice in there's one, two, three, four other things that we can imagine that they've had to work through, but there's no storms there. So they were able to come, you know, so the body was able to come to an agreement that, you know, we can do this, and this is the plan, and this is how we're going to move forward. So there was no tension there. But it's those spaces when the family has made a request or has an expectation that the body just can't wrap their mind around, or they just can't physically do it for whatever reason. That's where the tensions go. And there at the bottom, you're going to have to use your pen because I, I realized way too late that I already printed all of them before I realized that the last, the bottom words were cut off. So I was very upset. But so on the left-hand side under the body of believers, factors, you know what, this should have been a better question too. Um, factors that influence our practices, what are those factors? And what are our attitudes about a subject? The word subject should have been there. So if you want to pencil, pen that in. And then on the other side, what are the factors that are influencing their expectations? And what are their attitudes about a request? From my own own experiences, the fact that I had been told, we just cannot support your family, I could have taken that to the extreme and gone to the next church and said, the last church were jerks, right? They wouldn't help me. They didn't want me around. Are you going to kick me out too? I hear so many stories like that. And it's not helpful. And it's heartbreaking that the family even has to approach you know, it in that manner. But they've been wounded, right? And how do we figure out how to come alongside? 
um, those those individuals who have been wounded in that way. It, it doesn't mean that you put aside your own concern, your own um, non-negotiables, essentially. But you also have to know what those non-negotiables are, right? That we're not going to allow kids to run up and down the aisles because this, that, and the other, right? And as long as you can communicate that, right? Then the next step is, well, how do we make sure that your family can worship, right? And then that just becomes an individual ex ex um, adventure at that point. Going back to that um, responsive design, how do we help them to, you know, to be able to do, um, you know, to participate? All right. So... Yeah, so there's a lot more in your handout, but I'm going to let leave that for JT to be able to walk you all through. I want I really want us to do this thing. So, one of the things that um, one of the um, exercises that can really make this um, really tangible quickly is um, what would it look like? Oh, thank you. That's so cool. What would it look like? for us to, um, to consider our hospitality in relation to individuals with disability, right? If the goal is to help a family to feel welcome and to feel belonging, what would it take for us to do that? And, and I want us to kind of take a minute to think about our hospitality, now we live. We're here, kind of in the south. We're really, we're almost too close to the Mason-Dixon line to, to say, you know, to totally exclude our northern brothers and sisters who did not experience growing up with southern hospitality, right? I mean, southern hospitality is its own creature, right? So on this, and we were going to do this kind of as a individual table, but you guys can just let's just we'll spend about five minutes thinking about this. On one side of this card, it says, what act or acts of hospitality say you are welcome here? And then on the other side, and some of you may have, have struggled with this difference, again, our Southern hospitality folks, what act or acts of hospitality say you belong here? Let's take a couple minutes and think through that. Even if it's just one or two things, what what kinds of things say you're welcome? And then flip it over. What kinds of things say you belong here?
right. Anybody have an idea of what? Let's start with one or two things that say you belong. But no, sorry. What are two things that say you are welcome here? Anybody have an idea? Greeting someone with a smile when they come through the door. Absolutely. Say it again. Giving assistance. Giving assistance. Helping with whatever they might need. Yeah, so giving and accommodation. Yeah. All right, how about the things that express belonging? This is God's house. You're welcome. We hope you come back next week. Helping them make a connection. No judging. Yeah. 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 So already, ha- so having folks that they would, so that a new person would be able to identify with. Absolutely. JT, you had. Yeah, inviting someone. Inviting someone to serve, actually taking a part. Mm-hmm. Allowing someone to share their story. Absolutely. List and listening to them. Yeah. Being willing to get to know someone on their terms. And say the last part again. Making sure they're comfortable, right? Again, kind of going back to that story with the person that just took it upon herself to lay hands on the person and start praying, not knowing if he even appreciated that. Asking if they have any questions. Sure. Yeah, wanting their feedback. Right? It's just not, you know, we're glad you're here. You know, so long. Right? Yeah. Those those are pretty powerful. Well, JT, before we started, you had two pretty, do you remember the two things that you had said, the different... Yeah. Yes, which is why I said some of you Southern hospitality folks, right? Right, the difference between serving someone when they come to your house, or like offering them a drink, versus saying, you absolutely help yourself. Whatever's in the fridge, yeah, make yourself at home, right? So I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to be able to do this in one minute, but... There's two stories in Scripture that I will hope that you will take take home with you to explore. 2 Samuel 9 and Luke 14. Those two Scriptures are essentially talking about tables, and they're talking about majestic tables. And I'm not going to give it away why this is important, but those two chapters... If we can grasp, if we can get our minds around why those two chapters are in Scripture as it relates to how we are expected to interact, to interface, to serve, to serve with, to serve, to encourage people to serve themselves, 
if we can figure those why those two chapters are in scripture you guys will be in great shape to be able to to do some things differently in order to be able to to really serve individuals and their families with disability and that's one thing i didn't mention you know we we've talked a lot about the individual with the disability but most individuals come with families right and many of those are forever families right my kids are not going to go away to college they're not going to join the military they they were children then in in church then they were youth in church and now they're young adults in church and they'll be probably senior adults in the same you know in the church that I'm a part of right they're not going away right so it's not enough for us to think about the the kids and the the, the kids and how we're supporting them because those kids are going to grow up to be the youth and those most likely those youth are going to graduate and they're going to stay right here so what how are we preparing how is restoration preparing for those those families that will be forever families here. So I'd love to close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this group of people that have gathered this evening, and I thank you for the leadership here at Restoration who saw to, saw fit, the leader, the, both pastors and sessions, saw fit to explore this conversation at a much deeper level. And I know this is just getting started, and there's so much to cover. But, Lord, I pray that you will help everyone take exactly what they need home to be able to explore what it is that you would have them to take away from this evening and what they need to do with that information. Lord, bless this church. Bless this body of believers who desire to reflect you in this, in this community. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Michelle. No time for questions. I'm sorry. Wow. Well, you sticking around for, for a couple I can for, for, a for, a, minutes, for a little yes. bit here. Michelle, yes. you also serve in a variety of capacities in our presbytery. You serve as the Yes, but this is the this is the flag that I prefer, okay? I carry a lot of flags. I, I fly a lot of flags, but this is the most important one. Or I've also explained it. Does, has anyone seen an iron in a forge? Right? It's mm. the iron just sits there in the fire until it gets red hot, right? Well, my forge has like a lazy season and there's irons all around the circle so we just spin the dial a lot of irons in the fire find the iron that i need to pay attention to but this is my this is the wonderful the flag that i prefer so thank you michelle thank you uh friends again before before we uh just leave this evening let me encourage you okay our church restoration church whether you know it or not has quite a few individuals in our midst who we would consider in the category disabled. Some of them not uh, very visibly present. Uh, what, what, how, would you, how would you say that? Those um, are invisible. Disabilities. Invisible disability. Yeah, okay. Invisible disabilities. But let me encourage us as we continue to love people in our congregation to know those individuals in our midst, whether they've shared it with a small few or not, let me encourage us as a body, to love those who are currently here as well as how can we be welcoming and preparing for individuals who have yet to come into our space that they might feel like they can belong here in our midst. So that is a good charge to us as a church. Michelle, thank you very much. Friends, if, if you would like to go the, the next step, so there's a bunch of questions we didn't get to here at the back that Michelle has prepped us with that are really good uh, I've almost said thought experiments, but they're not. These are practical pieces for us to think through as a church. How might we better serve those in our midst who are currently here or who have yet to grace us with their presence? Those are some great questions there. I would love to unpack some of those with you as well. If you would like to be part of a, uh, a disabled advocacy group here in the midst of our church, on Sunday mornings at events, looking for those perhaps who might need extra attention, extra care, 
extra love, we've been talking as a session trying to think through what might that look like to task certain individuals as team members to bring people in, help them to feel welcome, and walk them to a place where they might feel like we can belong here. If that's like something like that you would like to be involved in, uh, please reach out to myself, reach out to Bill, reach out to an elder, um, and we'd, we'd love to come alongside you and serve with you as the whole body of Christ here. This is not something you would do. We would do it all together, but let us know, all right? Any final questions, final thoughts? Go in peace, friends. <laughs>